Well, first of all, I just want to say thanks again to Carl for joining me for this. Um, I like to call him the grandfather of the value of solar policy. Um, and uh, in terms of its implementation and, and its, uh, you know, initiation uh, with Austin Energy in Texas, uh, where Carl spent many years um, as one of the uh, executives uh, at that municipal utility. Um, and the idea here is essentially to look at this concept, the policy value of solar, um, particularly in the context of all of the stuff that's going on out there in the solar market, and ask the question, you know, is this the way to go um, as we look toward evolutions of compensate uh, electric customers who generate power from solar. So I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, my goal is to keep this summary to about 15 minutes or less so that we can have uh, time to uh, have conversation with Carl and uh, also get your questions. So um, jumping right in then, uh, the real concept here is how do we come in with your um, a, a proxy? We use essentially subtract from their energy consumption with on-site energy production and that's created a lot of tension. In fact, if you look at this map across the country uh, of state by uh, state uh, uh, debates, state battles between utilities and their customers over this value of solar energy and that includes uh, calling questions about net metering, um, looking to implement demand charges, a range of policy debates that are happening across the country in, in at least half of states um, around this notion of what is the value of customer provided solar energy and how should utilities value that um, and recover their costs uh, to provide electricity when that solar is not producing. So it, it's a big issue. It's one that's uh, taking up a lot of space uh, in the renewable energy policy world. And I want to just give a little bit of background on why it is that this is coming to a head right now. So in the past, which is kind of the left side of this chart, you have three lines here. You have yellow is the cost of electricity from solar arrays on rooftops or you know, on commercial buildings. In the blue, you have the retail rate, uh, electric, electric retail rate, which has generally been rising in the past decade, about 4 to 5 percent per year. And in the green, you have this sort of concept of the value of solar. Don't get too hung up on the, on the axis, left axis for the actual values, but just know that these are meant to be sort of relative. It's about their relative position to one another. So in the past, we have the cost of solar was far higher than its value uh, to, the, uh, to the electric grid, uh, but also far higher than the retail energy price. And so we made solar work. Uh, we, we got the deployment we wanted to drive down the cost by using taxpayer-funded subsidies like the investment tax credit uh, to make solar economical or state-based and, and utility-based rebate policies. And what this meant then ultimately was that because those dramatically drove down the cost of solar, solar customers were often providing more value to the grid than they got paid for. Um, because retail rates were relatively low and using net metering policies, customers were only getting um, to offset their energy prices, their energy purchases um, with net metering. And now we're at a time in the present, uh, moving forward a little bit, and, and the present of course is relative to what state you're in and the quality of your solar resource and the price of your electricity. And so this is, again, this is not going to be uh, exactly true for any particular place, but is in the next few years here, we're going to have a time when the cost of solar energy, the value of solar energy, and the retail energy price are all in the ballpark. They're all fairly similar. And what this means is that minimal subsidies are needed to make solar economical, as we're seeing as more and more people, more and more markets are opening up, uh, despite the um, erosion or the elimination of many state and utility-based subsidies. Um, and, and retail prices have risen to a level where they are fairly close to, in many cases, the value of solar, although I'll show a little bit later that um, they still lag behind in many places. And then, we, of course, we have the future here, and, and this, isn't, uh, this is a prediction, you know, and, and, and given with this caveat, just like they do when you are making an investment in the stock market, that past results or past performance is not indicative of future results. If we continue out this trend line, solar continues to get cheaper. Uh, retail new prices will continue to rise, and the value of solar will remain somewhat stable. Um, although, we'll, as we'll talk later, there uh, is some debate about how the value of solar may change over time. But ultimately, uh, we're going to get to this point where the value of solar uh, energy will be less than the retail electricity price, and that alone will be sufficient to cut, compensate solar producers without any other kinds of payments or subsidies. Um, and then the retail rate. Uh, um, of solar will be enough, as you can see, because it will be much higher than the value of solar. So you may have states like Hawaii, for example, where the retail price of electricity is in the 35 cent 
um, push you to the grid might be lower, like 20 cents. And yet it would still be high enough to use that price to compensate solar electricity uh, that's fed into the grid. Um, so we, get, we're, we have gotten to this point now where um, we're at a point of relative parity between these different methods of compensating in a way that's fair for everybody. And in a piece that I published a number of months ago that I thought would be a good foundation for this conversation, I asked the question, you know, we have this value of solar policy and should we use it? And I uh, cover a couple of alternative policies that we could consider as well. Um, and so I want to cover those right now. So option one is the value of solar. And the basic premise behind value of solar is that it's a buy all sell all relationship. All the energy that is produced on a solar array is sold to the grid at that selling price, that value of solar price, and the customer continues to buy all their energy um, as they have previously. And as long as there's a, uh, a premium, the value of solar over the customers will actually benefit from this. And in the long run, if the retail price is higher than the value of solar, customers will still benefit by cutting their electric costs, but they may not get as much as they would have under net metering. Um, but on the other hand, we may still be able to expand solar at a relatively low cost. So a couple of examples about value of solar. The, the idea behind it, uh, as I hope most are familiar with, is that we have identified a number of different values that solar provides, whether that's local capacity, avoided transmission access, environmental benefits, such as uh, compliance with a renewable portfolio standard, avoided transmission losses, and of course, um, avoided costs or uh, brown energy replacement, uh, as they call it in Palo Alto, which means, you know, what does it cost to, to uh, supplant a kilowatt hour of, of similarly priced fossil fuel energy or similarly available fossil fuel energy. Um, and here you have, uh, I gave the example of Excel Energy in 2015. Their value of solar is calculated with the state formula, although this is, again, not being used um, for compensating solar producers, is 13.6 cents, which for context is about a penny and a half higher than the retail electricity price for residential customers. So the value of solar right now in Minnesota is higher than the retail energy price, which means uh, ultimately that customers using net metering are actually getting compensated less than they would under a value of solar policy. And that in fact is going to be true in a lot of different places. In a study that was released um, two weeks ago by Environment America uh, surveying all, a number of value of solar studies, what they found is that especially when you looked at studies that were not commissioned by utilities themselves, the value of solar was uh, higher if not substantially higher than retail electricity prices for many different utilities. In other words, that we're, we're still in that period right now, where uh, maybe in, uh, in that graphic that I showed earlier, where uh, value of solar is still higher than retail electricity prices for many utilities, and may be so for the next few years. So value of solar is one way that we could use to compensate producers, and the idea is that it's a very transparent market-based price. It's based on the actual value of that energy to the grid, and it avoids these uh, issues that we're hearing about with uh, cross subsidies or, or uh, solar customers not paying their fair share. Uh, those are phrases that we hear a lot. Um, another option would be net metering plus the value of solar. So what you would do is um, rather you, you would still use net metering for energy that was uh, um, produced that is, was less than the energy consumed on site, which is to say a customer could offset their entire electricity use, but if they had excess energy generation, they would get paid for that at the value of solar price. So I tried to illustrate that in a chart, uh, which I admittedly made this morning. But the, the notion here is that uh, at the 100 line there, uh, that, that represents how much energy a customer uses on an annual basis. Um, for en energy produced from their solar array uh, that's below that threshold, uh, they're credited at the retail rate because they're simply subtracting kilowatt hours. Any energy produced that's above that would be sold to the grid. A second way that we could uh, alternative uh, uh, that uses value of solar um, uh, and net metering would be to say that net metering uh, offsets are only for on-site use. So you can see in this graphic, the only thing that's bigger is that there's more excess energy to sell. That's because the customer is only getting a retail rate credit for energy that's actually used at that moment on the property, as opposed to reconciled at the end of every month or every year, uh, as is typically done with net metering. So again, in this trying to show on that same graphic, you know, now the customer is probably able to use significantly less of the total energy produced because uh, most re residential customers might be off at work and not using a lot of electricity, for example, uh, while their solar panels are producing a lot of energy. So um, their uh, grid, grid electricity use um, is still credited um, at that retail rate, 
um, or they still get a credit for energy that's used on site, but they're going to be selling quite a bit more at that value of solar price. And of course, the other option is to simply stick with net metering. And there's a lot of rationale that's offered up for this uh, around the notion that it, you know, if it costs, you know, say 12 cents a kilowatt hour for Excel Energy in Minnesota to deliver power uh, to a residential property, um, then why shouldn't any on-site energy generation receive that same price? Because it is delivering um, at that um, at that location at that time. Um, so these are the different options that I laid out um, in my paper or in my article, um, and there are certainly going to be many more. But I would like to then switch over to questions. I wanna, what I want to tee off with here is a few questions for Carl, and these are uh, what I like to call sponsored questions, which isn't to say that anybody gave me money to ask these questions, but these were questions that I solicited of folks that I thought um, were really well informed in this area of value of solar and net metering, and, and particularly, uh, I think, well placed to ask questions about the, cru the crucial issues. So I want to kick off with this one here um, from Rick Gilliam, who's with Vote Solar, um, who says, you know, how can a prospective solar customer evaluate their investment with the value of solar since there's no reduction in the consumption of grid power? You know, they're not offsetting their own energy use. And what particularly what will happen if the value of solar is not fixed? Um, you know, how can a customer make an evaluation about how this is going to be worth? So I'm going to turn off my presentation at this point, my screen share, and put on my video and uh, throw this question to Carl, first of all, uh, for our conversation. Okay. Um, can you hear me all right? I can. Good. All right. Then I managed to turn my microphone and my camera back on. Uh, it, so great question from Rick, who obviously knows a lot about this stuff. I uh, worked with Rick on, on several things, uh, especially back when I lived in Colorado. The, it prompts me to, to make one just sort of general comment first to clear the air on a, what I think is a pretty common misunderstanding. Um, and this goes to your description, John, of sort of the, the value of solar as a FASA or a buy-all, sell-all. And, and the law professor in me is compelled to say that the way we did in Austin and Minnesota to structure the value of solar tariff was to specifically avoid uh, what's been described as a buy-all, sell-all. A lot of people think that Austin required the solar meter to be on the utility side of the transaction, and that mistake was repeated in a Skadden Arps memo, and it's been repeated by a number of people who have questioned how it works. It, in fact, it's embedded in the third line of this question, since it talks about no reduction in consumption of grid power. Um, the best way, I think, to structure the value of solar tariff is option one, kind of, but to do everything on the customer side of the, the meter. So it's still net metering. It's The solar still offsets your consumption. Um, all we end up discussing is what the credit for that offset should be. We don't want to create a sale of power because that means you're involved in a sale of power. Um, and you're not selling all your power, so you don't have to buy all your power back from the utility. So there is, in fact, a reduction in consumption of grid power, but it's done through a netting of the numbers. Um, and you still stay in the safe side of FERC regulation because you're still doing that metering, and you're still staying on the safe side of your tax credits because you're primarily generating for your own use. So, that, so the first and most important thing to say is that the charging mechanism, sort of in the two-part rate that we designed in Austin and in Minnesota, does not change the nature of the transaction as net metering. And, in fact, what it does do, though, that's really beneficial, as you pointed out, John, it creates and reinstalls an important incentive to conserve energy, which is an important policy consideration. You know, we there's a one of the perverse effects of traditional net metering, where the value for the excess is less than the value of the retail rate, right? You know, so in other words, there are those places where you can offset up to retail, and I think this was in your uh, option two, but you can offset up to retail and then you just get avoided cost for the excess. Well, that actually creates a pretty strong incentive to use all the electricity you can from your solar panels. And it sort of denies the rest of the grid the benefit of some pretty valuable on-peak power. If you separate those two flows, 
and do a net billing arrangement still behind the meter, the customer actually gets a pretty strong incentive to conserve um, because they'll save the charge side and they'll benefit the value of solar side. So that's a plus there instead of uh, seeing it as a reduction in consumption of grid power. Now what if the value of solar is not fixed? Well, your line, um, the green line that you had going straight across the graph, uh, John, I think really answers this question pretty well. What we've been doing with the value of solar where it's been introduced is using a levelized number. So for the guys that aren't the sort of rate making geeks out there, basically what you do is you take a stream of different a stream of different values, each different in every year, and you average them to become one number. Then you stretch that number across. So it's a, this is the same principle that you know, we use in a lot of investments. It's always used by utilities in integrated resource planning in order to compare potential options that have different lives and different characteristics. We reduce it to what that's called the levelized cost of energy. So um, what happens in that levelization is that a discount factor is applied. And things that are a long way in the future are pretty discounted, and things that are happening in the near term are not very discounted. So what, means, what, it, what that means is that the levelization itself is a good way to create stability in the value. When you're doing 25 or 30 year levelization, that number is not going to change dramatically unless somebody manipulates the formula. So those are my uh, quick answers, not quick answers, but anyway, diving in answers to those, to those two great questions. So I have another question, and this one is raised by Jigger Shaw, who, you know, formerly of Sun Edison, has been a big player in the solar industry. You know, he's made the contention uh, that the reason that we have net metering as a policy framework for compensating on-site energy consumption is simply that utility billing systems are so antiquated, it's basically the best we can do. Um, that we don't have the sophistication to be able to reward time of use energy production or any of those other kind of things. Uh, you know, what would you say to that? And do you feel like the value of solar, as you described it, as a you know as a crediting mechanism behind the meter, uh, is that is that uh, usable or more usable simply because it continues that kind of relationship that's simple enough for a utility billing system to accommodate? Yeah, this is one of those. This is one of those things that's. That I love, we used to, we used to love um, using one example when I was at Rocky Mountain Institute about sort of why are our railroad tracks as wide as they are. And if you follow it all the way back in time, you'll end up finding out that it's about the width of a horse's ass because the chariot wheels that made the ruts that the Romans used became the pathways for the tracks and that got exported from England to the United States and our railroad tracks are about the width of a horse's ass. And so we have a lot of technological legacy issues. Like that. I would argue that, that in addition to what Jigger's saying, we build billing systems around the technology we have, so he needs to go back even a step further which is just the old mechanical disc analog meter that was incapable of differentiating anything, indicating anything, but it's net forward progress. So sometimes the wheel spins back, sometimes it spins forward, but all we could end up reading from those old analog meters was net forward progress, which is why basically net metering was a good label. Now we are capable of having two channel meters and we could put in separate meters and even in some, a lot of utilities where the count on the number of solar customers are around is so low, they're still hand billing these transactions and they're not collecting the data. And there's still a lot of mechanical analog disk meters out there. So Jigger's right. Um, it, when we get the capability of discerning this information at a finer degree of granularity, the utilities will be able to understand. But in the meantime, they can understand even just one thing if they add, I mean, well, I'll put it this way. In Austin, the state of Texas required the utility to have a separate meter because we had a reporting requirement. We had to report micro generator uh, production information every month. So when we started supporting solar in Austin, 
we just said you're going to have to put on a solar meter behind the revenue meter so we know how much solar is made so we can report it to the PUC. A great little example of how a regulator can actually drive a little bit of technological progress. Like I said, now we can do that with two meters, but with that information you can actually start making progress towards the value of solar. You can understand that in fact even under traditional net metering customers are fully charged, including solar customers, are fully charged for all of their consumption. And it's not just the net forward progress. The net forward progress only tells you that they had all their consumption, but that some of it was offset by spinning the meter the other way. Again, the mechanical meter can only spin, only gets one, you know, X number of revolutions per Y units of energy, the value of solar innovation allows us to multiply those spins in one direction by one number and the spins in a direction by another number, and that's the value of solar Terra. So it just, you know, this is really interesting for me because I walk past my electric meter every time I go into my house and I have a spinning disk. I happen to be served by Excel Energy in Minnesota. And so, uh, you know, is the value of solar not are, is it not possible for them to implement the value of solar tariff with the technology they have with my meter um, without having a second meter installed? I don't know that they can. I, I think they have to change their meter to a better grade, more sophisticated meter, in which case they'll be in that territory that Jigger was describing, or they could require a generator meter behind their revenue meter to measure the output of your solar system, or we can figure out how to get your inverter to report the data it's collecting because a lot of inverters today have revenue grade quality data collection on them but utilities don't allow it or don't think of it as a source for that information. Would it possibly be because they don't own it, Carl? It, you know, there's, it's, the, it's, <laughs> yeah, we, I told you that one time, I said, you know, I asked one utility in a case I was in as an expert witness and and I said, how, how do you value behind the meter generation? And their response was, because we neither own nor control it, we assign it no value at all. Um, speaking of the value of solar, uh, Laurel Passera from the Interstate Renewable Energy Council offered a question uh, I, from, you know, in response to my solicitation about um, that chart that we mentioned earlier with the value of solar remaining constant um, and how we would uh, you know, calculate a levelized value that folks could secure on a long-term contract as, as is done in Minnesota. Um, now her question is why would the value of solar remain constant over time? Why, why wouldn't it go up or down? And, and I think she's referring to you know, the year-to-year -year recalculation of what value of solar is on that levelized long-term basis. Her, you know, so she specifically notes that if rates are going up then utilities must be justifying that with higher costs, and if costs are higher, then presumably avoiding these costs is a bigger benefit, and that the value of solar shouldn't be higher. And, and ultimately, she says, and if that's the case, if as the costs for the utilities go up, if rates go up, and it represents rising costs for utilities, then why wouldn't the retail rate be a good proxy for the value of solar? I think that's a really key question. Yeah, it's a great, the, 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 Laurel's so smart. It, there's a whole bunch of wonderful things uh, nested in there. Let's, um, let's go backwards, sort of, well, no, I'll try to stay in the order. So, so the, first, the first question is, well, should it change every year? And, you know, the, that's a separate question from how long do you give, do you set that at the credit rate? So let's just say, for example, you know, it completely real time would be that the utility, if they were a modern utility, sort of beyond Jigger's example, knew the exact price of power every single minute and then could calculate the exact avoided cost and va therefore value of solar generation every single minute. We'd have minute by minute. Nobody's there, but that's the extreme. That's the far end of that continuum. The other end of the extreme is like nuclear power. I'm going to have this thing for 40 years and I'm going to figure out one fixed rate for it and I'm, going to calc and I'm just going to collect that and I hope I'm right. And you can tell what the, what the risks are, right? On the one hand, you've got perfect stability, a 40-year value for your power plant, 
but chances are you're going to be over or under most of the time. The other one is this amazingly precise number, but the amazingly precise number requires supercomputers to calculate and disseminate, and it varies through so many factors that you'll never actually get the number out by the time you need it. So we're just looking at what's the number, what number in between those you know, extremes do we want to use. We can decide to set like Minnesota did and say, well, the value of solar that's in effect, that's been calculated on the year you start your system will be the one you get for 20 years. And as long as you include an inflation escalator, that can work. A feed-in tariff does exactly the same thing for 10 or 15 years. Or you can do like I first implemented in Austin, we're saying, well, we're going to change the compensation rate every year. That's just a policy question. But one of the real benefits of recalculating the value of solar every year, like you recalculate your fuel charge every year, is to reduce a problem known as regulatory lag the problem of being behind the times on the numbers. Think about what happens with some of the feed-in tariffs. Ontario is still paying 80 cents per kilowatt hour for some of their early feed-in tariff contracts. It was a fair number at the time, but it creates a lot of political problems when people say that you're writing checks for 80 cents in a time when wind can be purchased for four. So there's a political consequence to tying your hands for too long. Second of all, there's, the, there's what are we trying to do with solar? Do we want it to be on a permanent subsidy plane? Do we want a 50-year price for solar like a, or a 40-year contract for nuclear power? Or do we want it, solar markets to move closer to the market and live in, closer to real time and prices? These are policy choices that can be enabled and supported by choosing this time period, right? And then, so, so it's, it's your choice when you implement it. You, I would like to see a world in which people can choose how much stability they want on their value of solar. They'll lock in their, like you do with an interest rate on a home or any other kind of lending. It's, I want a 10-year rate. I'm risk adverse. And so, well, here's your number for that. I'm willing to live with a one-year rate and bet that prices are going to go up. That'll work. Okay, so that's just, none of this, written is, of this is written in stone. These are good policy discussions to have when you try to move towards more value-based. Last thing is this, this issue of, well, doesn't the rate case take care of everything for you at, under traditional net metering? And the it's really important to recognize that net metering offers no stability whatsoever. And that's the first thing that's implicit in that question is because every time a rate changes, the value of your solar changes under traditional net metering, right? And we've seen in the past a certain amount of stability in rates, but we've also seen a recent boom in power plant and transmission construction that's starting to work its way through the entire industry. And every time those rates get changed, the quote value of solar under net metering changes as well. Now what some people are betting on is that retail rates always go up. So if you can lock your solar in to retail rates, that's a good deal. And that's kind of fairly assumed by what's going on here. But Remember how, well, no, you should, if you don't know, you should know how horribly complex rate making is. Those, these rate cases are prolonged, they're expensive, and they're difficult. And I've been, I've only done a few hundred of them, but I can tell you in none that I've seen has the solar industry appeared to say, now when you set this retail rate, Remember, this is going to be the substitute rate value for solar. So let's, make, let's take into account some of these principles. In fact, what we find ourselves doing in these rate cases is trying to fight off standby charges and capacity charges and fixed customer charges that are snuck in in these gigantic cases just so that they don't do sort of mischief to solar as a side issue in a much bigger proceeding. So um, I would argue that a focused proceeding on what the value of solar is 
is a much more elegant way to make sure we're staying current. It turns out that a lot of the determinants of establishing that value can be, are in rate cases, but they're also in fuel factor reconciliations that typically occur once a year. So um, I want to encourage folks, if you want to ask questions, uh, there is a questions tab or option in your control panel where you can submit questions. I've got a couple more that I'm going to throw Carl's direction here. Uh, but then I would like to hear from you. Um, if the question tab for some reason doesn't work, there's always the chat option um, and would encourage you to submit questions that way and we will um, uh, be checking that. Um, Carl, so two more questions for you. One is looking at this notion of uh, demand charges that you just mentioned. Um, I just heard from a reporter in Colorado who's been covering this discussion. There's a Colorado-based cooperative. Um, that wanted to initially do demand charges on residential customers, which isn't traditionally done. Demand charges, of course, uh, relative to your peak use at any given time over a, a month, as opposed to the amount that you consume in total. Um, and their, their revised plan, I thought was very interesting, an interesting twist, um, was to look at the ratio between average use uh, on a kilowatt basis and peak use and the, the demand charge will only apply to customers whose peak use is 10 times higher or more than their average use, which is to say they're using very little energy from the grid uh, on a monthly basis, but they may, because of, you know, at nighttime maybe on one particular evening they're using a lot, um, or maybe their solar panel goes out or it's a very cloudy day or something, and so their, their peak use uh, is significantly higher. Uh, I'm curious what you think of that notion and how that, uh, gets to this issue of fairness and cost sharing and whatnot we hear so so much about in this conversation about the value of solar energy. Yeah, well, that's that's fascinating, right? You you, you know, rates don't just send signals to customers, and and we we can talk about that, but they also send signals to the utility. And imagine that a this utility could establish this rate as you're describing it where they get to charge anybody who has the super peaky thing under uh, a peaky demand under the under the theory that they're building that that whole system right for that super peak when it comes up and that's that's the argument it's like we have to build this for them because these guys come on and they just go crazy that that might be code for these are solar customers who keep their lights on after the sun goes down, but well, let's just let's not pretend that there is a uh, a subtext in this objective. But you, you, what comes to mind immediately is how easily it, a utility could go to a customer who had that kind of profile, and using some demand response or some solar or some storage, could find a far less expensive way to reduce their peak than just to charge them for it and, in, and to build the system for it as they say they have to do. So this, is a, so this is a rate that says, please make us overbuild this system. Make us find the most expensive solution to customer behavior that's out there. Make us ignore all the other alternatives. And that's exactly what's behind a lot of these fixed customer charges and this effort to go to demand charges with customers. They, some of these advocates know that the markets for storage and demand response and, and other solutions are not very sophisticated and that customers don't have a lot of experience with them. So right now, imposing demand charges of any kind on residential customers, or at least the vast majority of residential customers, is something of a hollow and cynical gesture. It says, you know, I'm going to send you a price signal about how peaky your demand is or how high your demand is, but I'm not going to provide you, I don't even think you have access to most of the tools you need to address that, quote, price signal. So first rule of fairness in rate making is that no utility should ever be allowed or allow themselves, if it's a co-op, to impose charges on customers that customers have no tools to manage against. And that's the real problem with these sort of fixed costs and demand charges. The second thing is, as I just said, it reinforces overbuilding behavior to say you're automatically entitled to, to recover these costs 
because you've found them. And then the third, and this is the most fundamental, is that there's a myth out there that there's some kind of economic efficiency benefit in symmetry between cost structure and price structure. This is the myth that, that because the utilities are seeing an increased amount of their costs as fixed, which is just simple arithmetic in a world in which demand is not rising as fast, the fraction of fixed is going to go up. But to then argue that it, the right thing to do is to increase the fixed component of customer rates is, is complete nonsense. There's no evidence that that boosts economic efficiency. It's just a way, as I just said, of securing monopoly rents. Um, what's, we should design our rates to accomplish our policy objectives, sending the right signals to customers and the right signals to the service providers, uh, not to sort of pursue some hypothetical, mythical sort of symmetry between cost structure and price structure. My simple example is Starbucks, right? I, you know, we've talked about this before, John. If, you know, Starbucks is a high fixed cost business, and yet they've figured out how to be very competitive with a variable pricing scheme. Starbucks would not survive in a competitive marketplace if they tried to charge you $10 cover charge for going in the store, or worse, send you a $10 bill just for them having the store available in case you ever wanted to buy coffee. You know, it's, I'm so glad that you got into this bigger picture about um, charges that utilities levy and, and sort of motivating customer behavior. Um, you know, the Rocky Mountain Institute, which has always done terrific work in this area, talks about, you know, what if we had some really um, sophisticated time of use pricing? Um, what if we had some really sophisticated uh, tools for customers to adjust to that? Um, you know, we talk about, for example, using a value of solar price that's distinct from this retail price because the retail price is set with so many other factors in mind that have nothing to do with the value of the solar energy being produced. Um, on the other hand, you know, if I was a customer and I was having a time of use rate, and, and let's just assume and presume that I have the tools to adjust that. And I, I give as this example, you know, I just got a new air conditioner installed, and with it they installed a new thermostat that allows me to, from my smartphone, turn on and off my air conditioner. And presumably it would not be that hard to have some logic built into that software program where I could say, you know, don't turn on at 4.30 p.m., uh, turn on at 5 p.m. or even you know have some inputs from the utility about what time of use pricing was. So I, I think the technology is obviously there. Um, does that then sort of get rid of this need to set a separate price for the value of solar if we can have a pricing scheme uh, that is sophisticated and, and that customers would have tools uh, readily accessible to manage their consumption? Um, does that get us more in the direction of that sort of Starbucks model, if you will, of where you know the pricing, it, the pricing is the pricing, and customers can respond accordingly. Yes, I mean ultimately we got to watch out for for customers who still don't have those tools or don't have the time, and I'll get to that in a second. But essentially that's what we're talking about, which is more granular, more nuanced pricing to allow customers to behave accordingly. So I am not against sending the time of use signal to the customer unless they don't have a way of responding to it. And I do notice that a lot of solar customers are increasingly pretty sophisticated in what they do, and so they may be able to take advantage of it. That's fair. The value of solar methodology, by the way, itself tries to capture that because it matches up solar output with the cost of energy production during each of the 8,760 hours. So. A good, a good value of solar methodology gives you an average number that works like that pretty well. But maybe you could get some added behaviors if you added some of these complementary technologies like controllable electric vehicle charging and like you said, sort of controllable consumption devices like your air conditioner or other major loads. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I, everybody gets their own price at that, or their own minute, and somebody's got a super smart computer that does that for everybody. You don't have to have a value of solar analysis. And maybe w rather than on my original continuum of that for everybody, we just make some progress toward that. 
by using concepts like value of solar. What we do, the, the, the other thing we do though is remember we're also trying to cure for a couple of problems that average rates create. Right? Most of the utility argument today about the problem of solar is that customers with solar are using less electricity than the utility hoped they would, right? They, they set these giant classes of customers Giant, all residential customers fit into one class, then they calculate an average rate for every single one of them, whether it's a, a low-income customer who can only barely afford to run a refrigerator and a box fan to, to all summer long, to uh, a rich suburbanite with 10 tons of air conditioning capability that peaks up to you know, 20 kilowatts of demand, and they all have the same average rate because utilities have not caught up with something else that's going on in the competitive world, which is customer segmentation. And so they set these big average rates, and then they complain that when you go spend some of your own hard-earned money and a little bit of federal support too, to reduce your electric bills that they have to be able to charge you back because you're not using average in your class. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the most socialistic thing I have ever heard. And they say, but we expected John was going to make a $100 contribution to fixed costs this month, and he only made 90 I need to go char bill him $10 because his, as, if he was a good average member of the class, he would have paid us 100 I just it boggles my mind to think of that. Let me go back on that other point though. Segmentation will also allow us to deal with some of the no, the sort of non-discretionary aspects of electricity consumption. It is still basically essential for life in the modern world. When you have two jobs and the only time when you can wash the clothes, cook the dinner, take care of the household stuff is between job one and job two and that happens to be the peakiest price on the electric system well then you're really talking about regressive rate making and this is why a lot of low and moderate income customers have a big problem with automatic AMI advanced metering because they thought it was a stocking horse for putting those kind of punitive rates on customers when again going back those customers didn't have the tools to respond to those prices. So segmentation, sort of understanding the costs and the benefits of your generation on your rooftop, the flip side of it, is a good way of advancing economic efficiency. Just watch out for fairness and policy concerns. Right, so I'm going to go to one of the questions we've got from the audience here about this, this infamous duck curve. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to see if I can actually show the duck curve here instead of my uh, ugly mug. Um, and so, folks, uh, Carl, can you let me know? Can you see our the duck curve as I've got it up in my browser here? Yeah. Yeah. Right, very good. Excellent. Um, I, yeah, I'm going to take a stab at this, but I'm going to look to you for support on this one. Um, and, and and this is uh, the duck here. The belly of the duck in yellow represents the erosion of expected energy consumption. Uh, f from solar, uh, which of course uh, comes in uh, during the middle of the day in particular, um, but then as solar energy wanes as the sun is setting in the afternoon, um, there's still an early evening peak in electricity consumption from air conditioners, and now there's going to be a much greater ramp up needed uh, in terms of non-solar power generation to meet that peak, uh, all else being equal. Um, and I, I think that the Key to this is to say, yes, number one, if we assume that key phrase, all else being equal, this will be a problem, as Carl mentioned before about the demand charge is the sort of assumption that um, utilities are going to continue to do things exactly the way they've done them, which is to say they are going to meet this peak demand in the traditional fashion of building new infrastructure. Yes, we have a challenging uh, uh, engineering situation, if you will, on the grid system, um, I, th I feel like, uh, Carl, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, though, that what, what I've heard in response to this is essentially we have not yet deployed any of the many tools that we have to shift energy demand around in a way that would mitigate this curve without the kinds of expensive new generation that utilities seem to imply is needed. Um, what more would you add to that, though? Uh, I'm about to tweet my favorite duck chart. Um, 
which is just as useful, I think. Um, so I'm going to post that right now, and I'll do I'll do the hashtag value of solar just so uh, people can pick it up. But um, yeah, this is this is probably um, there's so much. This is this is one of those wonderful. There it is. <laughs> so that's Excellent. my luck chart. Thank you for putting that up there. Um, yes. It's just as useful. Uh, you know, so yeah, John, you you said it. First of all, this is pretty much a single attribute kind of chart. Um, second of all, a good statistics class would tell you that it starts at eleven thousand. So and it you know so it, at the bottom line, so it has a it exaggerates the shape of the curve in order to make the point that it's trying to make. It it, it pretends that we're going to reach all the way out to twenty, uh, you know, out to some point in the future. Uh, and those high penetration rates, 2030, 2020 is the bottom curve, and we're going to do nothing else about this problem. It suggests, uh, by the way, that notwithstanding the fact that in California, solar has been developing for many, many years, that for some reason somebody didn't do more about this. I mean, where was everyone you know, in 2013 when that little tiny swell was developing there, you know, in hour 15. And why did it have to get so, why did it get so severe? What are the other combined causes? This electric system is so complex that uh, I find it hard to believe that we can use this duck chart to say this is all rooftop solar. And even if it is, then we've got a lot of solutions. Um, I just commend everybody's attention to the great paper. I think it was Jim Lazar from uh, RAP, uh, Regulatory Assistance Project, who wrote a piece I roughly titled something, Teaching the Duck to Fly, that reminds us we have a host of tools and resources available to us um, in order to uh, address the potential problem of that increased ramp and whatever that might mean for the grid managers. I also want to point out too, I, I, one of the things that I've enjoyed in, in sort of as a summary of all of these different critiques, Jim's being one of the better ones, uh, is that um, you know the, the, the way that this duck curve has been wielded is, is what I like to call crying foul, F-O-W-L, um, <laughs> and that we have um, many different ways to address this other than sort of the traditional uh, build out of capacity. Um, you know, coming back to value of solar for a minute, we have another question I think is a very important one here about value of solar. One, one person pointing out that um, value of solar might be relative to location, that there are certain areas on the grid that are more constrained, uh, more congested, have more capacity that could be offset by solar. Um, you know, how do we take that into account in our value of solar calculations? Should we have some sophistication built in for that, um, uh, given that it, that it is on the ground uh, something that matters? This is one of the most exciting things. This is one of the most, the very most exciting things about the value of solar concept in introducing value into electric rate making. Um, we all know, we've heard the statistic that only one in four residential customers has a roof suitable for solar. So why would you want a market uh, that would preclude the other three quarters of market potential? With going off the roof to shared community solar type stuff um, automatically invites you to go prospecting for your highest value locations because you are still going to be using a little of the grid. You won't be avoiding as much of it as you do with rooftop solar. So your inclination to at least maintain the value or to maximize the value is to go into the grid and find the places where the solar can add the most. And that invites the utilities to start collecting, analyzing, and sharing data at a subnodal level about marginal distribution capacity cost so that people with innovative distributed energy resource ideas, starting with solar, but you know, we've already heard the stories about the battery systems being installed or demand response cooperatives being installed. Those are going to be a great opportunity to stimulate some prospecting in the grid for the highest value applications. It, if there, I don't want to be too corny, but I said this recently on, on, in comment to something or other. 
the future is about location, location, location. What drives the variability in pricing and the conditions on the grid is the location within that grid and the features at that point. And we got to, you know, when I was, when I came up in this business, when I first started as a commissioner, gosh, 20 plus years ago, you know, the standard utility rate case was that the residential, the residential rates and the, the cost of the system for residential customers was built out using what they called the, the least distribution system or the minimum distribution system. They basically lumped everything under 30 kVA, kilovolt amps, Every, everything under that size was lumped in without discrimination, without understanding into the residential sector. And what we're finding now is that we could go down to much smaller levels and find higher and higher value. We've known it at least since the Kerman substation project that Dan Sugar and the other people at PG&E championed back in the, gosh, what is it, the 80s, the early 90s. Um, value-based value rate-making drives you toward that. And I think everybody wins on that proposition. So we've got another question here um, uh, from someone looking particularly at value of solar in Austin. Um, and they say, and I want to make sure we've got this right too, that, that uh, what were the reasons for switching to value of solar for residential customers but not commercial customers? Is there any reason that you wouldn't use it for commercial customers? Um, maybe go into some detail about that. And then I just want to let people know, we'll probably wrap up here in about five minutes. Um, I will be happy to take uh, and to share with Carl questions that are offered over email uh, and follow up to this webinar. I'll be happy to post those uh, at Q&A on our website. Um, and uh, we'll also give some folks information about how to find their webinar recording at the end here. Yep. So, Carl, so um, yeah, the, the just what we had going on at the time, um, First of all, it was a new concept, so we wanted to roll it out sort of, you know, in a measurable space. Just the year before, I had actually used the value of solar study to inform the setting of a PBI, a performance-based incentive for commercial customers when I was in Austin. There, by the way, there there was a secondary market for loans. There is not much of a secondary market for loans in the residential sector, although I hope it changes. But there, in the commercial sector at that time, it, getting a 10-year stream of incentive payments meant you could immediately flip that loan, knowing that that's what you'd be, what the solar installer would, or customer would get, so they could really sort of take advantage of better financing. We had just started it a year before, but the value of solar analysis, like I said, was critical in helping us set the right number for that incentive. Um, and we just wanted to let that run. It takes several years for people to organize around a market segment, for the lenders to get familiar, for the installers to price it in their products and build their business models around it. So uh, I didn't want to be like, you know, Congress sort of changing the incentives every year and having everybody wonder what was going on. There's no, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to use it, especially in a small commercial setting. Um, the value is the value, and it's on a KWH basis. It doesn't care whether it was made by a commercial customer or a residential customer. So um, that, it, it could work just as well. I, John, it does remind me, one of the things I wanted to point out real quick from going back at the start, one of the things that really concerns me about using a different value depending on whether or not your solar is offsetting or not, you know, one of the major features of the value of solar tariff was to say it's a kilowatt hour of solar electricity. It's worth the same amount regardless of whether it's offsetting or going to the customer nearby and serving their load. And since electricity tends to flow to the nearest load, you're pretty sure that if one homeowner doesn't use it, the next homeowner who doesn't have solar is going to. Um, but one of the reasons for keeping that value up there is that we didn't want, and this, some, this happens in that metering, when you have that difference product, um, we didn't want the value to de be in some arbitrary or ad hoc behavior either. Uh, what I say sarcastically is, you know, 
that your the value of your solar depends on whether you chose to blow dry your hair that day. You know, if you use it, wow, you got retail offset. If you didn't use it, oh, too bad, you only got avoided cost. Uh, you know, purple avoided cost. So it's, the kilowatt hour does the same work, and it's solar energy, and so it should have a uniform value, and that's a good way of, I think, sort of setting up this opportunity for value-based rates. Well, I, you know, I think I would say in summary, Carl, you know, covering these four different options that I outlined in that piece, and I, again, I thank you so much for your insight, is that, you know, value of solar seems to be, to be um, similar to, you know, sort of a, a more sophisticated, uh, well, let me put it this way, value of solar seems to move in the same direction that some of these other proposed changes to electricity pricing, that in, in either case, whether we're using more sophisticated time of use pricing that customers can respond to, or whether we're using value of solar, the notion is that we are making our pricing for energy and for customer produced energy more sophisticated. Yep. Um, you know, value of solar is a good proxy in the short run when we don't have very sophisticated electricity pricing that cut, and we don't have tools for customers to respond to other than putting solar on their roof. Um, you know, in the future though, it seems as though you might be able to capture the value of solar and, and the value of many other activities on the grid if customers are allowed to have the tools and use the tools to manage their own use, whether that's because their smartphones can aggregate their own uses or whether they've got smart appliances. Yep. Um, does that seem a fair I mean, not, not only that, I think it's, it's fair to say that is sort of, as, as Laurel sort of hinted before, that the, the value and the retail rate will converge as we increase the precision with which we calculate both. You know, I mean, and as we add more solar to the system, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, another one of these sort of Jigger Shaw things that we live with, which is just totally insane to me, but when PURPA was first passed, the utilities used their considerable political and regulatory influence to make sure that those avoided cost calculations were as small as possible. So they only were basically avoidable fuel. But we always have known that different resources bring different value. We have 20, 30 years of battles on avoided cost proceedings and regulatory proceedings. I remember advocates trying to say, well, wait, you're missing this and you're missing that, and you're missing all these features. We've been arguing here at PACE for over 25 years about how externalities are just externality is not a cuss word, it means it's a real cost you left out of the price. And because of that, leaving that real cost out of the price, you've distorted society's preference for that good or service. You should try to get the price right. You should try to close the gap between price, cost, and value. That's what will give you economic efficiency. So, so this is just another step. It says to us we have better tools than they had in 1978 or 1983 when PERPA avoided costs really young. We have more sophisticated analytical capabilities. We've been working on the problem for a while here. Why wouldn't we use our improved knowledge to make more efficient resource decisions, especially about something so important as our electricity? Well, Carl, I want to say thank you so much. I want to remind the listeners that uh, if you do submit questions, uh, you can send them to uh, me, Jay Farrell, at ILSR.org after the webinar. We'd be happy to collate them and Carl and I to take a stab at them. We'll publish them uh, next week on ILSR's website and wherever else Carl would like to share them. Um, you can find both of us on Twitter. We tweeted a few times during this uh, while we were talking. Um, Carl's at Robigo Energy, and I am at John F. Farrell. Um, Carl, is there anywhere else that people can find, follow, follow, uh, listen to, read things that you are producing? Well, I'm really excited to say that with some uh, support from a foundation, we're going to be starting uh, something we're calling a Value Solar Center of Excellence, where we're going to try to put together a lot of information for everybody who's interested. Um, in the meantime, my old uh, consulting website, robagoenergy.com, has got a lot of blog entries and a couple of links. And um, my Twitter feed <laughs> runs like you know a guy obsessed with value of solar and other issues. Uh, I try to I try to cool study about or related to it that I can. So there's a lot of John Farrell, of course, in my Twitter feed as well. Um, so so yeah, it's 
I'm learning some of these things, but but um, and of course use our contact information, like you said, and sort of reach out. Glad to help and share the word on this stuff. Sounds great. Well, thanks again, Carl, for joining me for this conversation. Really appreciate it. Talk soon. Thank you. All right, and thanks, Rebecca.